So this morning I get to, to speak, and uh, I'm really grateful for that. You might have seen I put a loaf of bread out here. Uh, just to let you know, it's not Communion Sunday. Uh, unfortunately, maybe it would have been a good Sunday, to, a good uh, lesson to talk about on, uh, on Communion Sunday. But uh, I wanted to talk about Communion because um, uh, I just... Uh, it's something that's kind of important, and uh, it's, a, it's a command that, the, that Jesus gave to us to observe, uh, to commemorate his death in communion. And uh, because when and where we commemorate it isn't so much important, uh, it's uh, how often we do it and, uh, and what we do when, and how we practice it. So what I'm talking about here is our communion service often comes at the end of our Sunday morning service. That's just how we do it. That's our format. Sometimes it might be at the end of, like, or during the Monday, Thursday service at Easter. Those are all significant times. And uh, because of the openness of our church services, uh, I mean, when we walk, open our doors, we just want people to come in. Like, that's our, our hope, is that people will come in and feel that our church is open and approachable and that this is a place where they can come and hear the Word of God and, and have a clear message. But uh, I'm just speaking here on behalf of the elders. Uh, I do not want to keep people from coming, but I also, when we talk about communion, there are some prerequisites, uh, some important things that we need to talk about. And uh, this service, this communion service that I'm talking about, is kind of unique. It's different from... When we have our Sunday morning service here, like uh, when we preach the Word of God and we encourage and admonish one another, uh, that service, the communion service, is actually, it's kind of like a lasting ordinance, and it's something that uh, Jesus gave to us, and it's uh, meant to be repeated. So I just want to be clear, uh, before anyone can participate in the communion service, and I mean specifically, like, taking the emblems of the bread and the cup of wine. They must be a Christian. It's not something that we can take lightly. Uh, that's where I wanted to make the, the, the distinction, is because when we come into our service, uh, that part is open for everybody. But then, if when we celebrate communion together, we, we have to be clear that those who actually take the emblems, the bread or the wine... That's uh, something that there's uh, some prerequisite. So let's talk about that. What does that mean? Well, a person first must understand the message of the gospel. So what is that? Number one, because we are sinners, we have violated God's perfect law. So we deserve God's punishment. That's our first thing to understand in the gospel. Number two, I repent. I respond to God's invitation and I repent of what I've done. I, I agree with God's judgment of myself. God's telling me, you've sinned, you're a sinner, and I must agree with him. You have a choice, though. You can disagree with him, but in order to become a Christian, we have to agree with God's judgment. Number three, I ask to be forgiven by God. The gospel tells me this is a free gift. There's no need to earn it. God's offering it to us. And then number four, I accept. I accept Jesus Christ into my heart and my life. And I know that he, he alone is the one who can save me from this punishment that God has told me about. So when we have made those, that decision and we followed through with it, the way is now open. God has given us his spirit. He's given us the okay that we have received his blessing of forgiveness. And there's nothing stopping us from going public with it, being baptized. So then we're able to kind of step forward, and now it's some, an important decision. And, and that's what's so cool about it. It's like when anyone has come to know Christ, uh, they get to share it, and then we get to like kind of tell everybody, like, hey, I just want you to know like something really important's happened in my life. So... And that's kind of like what I was actually reading a book about baptism, and it's called Going Public. So uh, that's where I kind of took that term. 
And then, uh, once you're baptized, the next step is to be able to continue to commemorate his death, to remember. And that's where the communion service comes in. So you can see there's like steps to it. And that's where I think, uh, I just wanted to make that uh, clear because often we're, you know, uh, when Communion Sunday comes up, uh, I'm really grateful Jordan was able to explain to us like uh, it's important that we examine ourselves and that we uh, understand the significance of what this is. But it's actually not open to people who haven't yet come to Christ. And it's actually, Paul gives a severe warning that if anyone takes those emblems without having first being forgiven by God, then they actually are... Uh, bring about like a, a curse on themselves. They're, they're actually going to, they're in disobedience. So, and with us knowing that, we can't allow someone to step forward when we know that they haven't first gone through those steps and then are ready to be able to take communion. So I just wanted to kind of state that. And uh, if you can, just turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 78. Now I kind of hope to be able to just kind of like, um, kind of renew our, our, our love for communion because it's actually something uh, that's really important. So turn with me to Psalm 78, and uh, I think we'll just start right down in verse 12, and I'm going to read down to verse 21. Give you a chance to turn to it. I'm reading from the New Living Bible, and uh, I think there's Bibles in the pews. I'm not sure. I'm sorry if I didn't uh, have the page here, the page number in the, the pew Bibles there. But starting in verse 12, it says, The miracles he did for their ancestors on the plain of Zoan in the land of Egypt. He divided the sea and he led them through. He made the waters to stand up like walls on either side. In the daytime, he led them by a cloud and all night by a pillar of fire. He split open the rocks in the wilderness to give them water as from a gushing spring. He made streams pour from the rock, making the waters flow down like a river. Yet they kept on sinning against God, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They stubbornly tested God in their hearts demanding the foods they craved. They even spoke against God himself, saying, God can't give us food in the wilderness. Yes, he can strike a rock so water gushes out, but he can't give his people bread and meat. When the Lord heard them, he was furious. The fire of his wrath burned against Jacob. Yes, his anger rose against Israel, for they did not believe God or trust him to care for them. Actually, and I'll just read down here to uh, verse 24. Yet, I love that. <laughs> Despite his anger, yet, he commanded the skies to open. He opened the doors of heaven. He rained down manna for them to eat, and he gave them bread from heaven. So I'm just going to end right there. Just going to stop there for now. Uh, I just really wanted to kind of uh, emphasize that that last verse. Uh, I love that that kind of that clause in there that uh, where he says uh, yet. So the writer of the psalm is explaining that this like how uh, the people of Israel uh, they didn't trust him and they angered him, and yet despite the fact that they were in disobedience, his love came through. He gave a command to the skies above. He opened the doors of heavens of the heavens. He rained down manna for the people to eat, and he gave them grain of heaven. So I started with these verses today, and I just wanted to lay a groundwork for the basis of my message, and I'll come back to this later. Uh, this morning, I'm just uh, speaking about our practice of communion, and like anything that's repetitive, um, we risk letting it become too familiar. So sometimes, like in workplaces, there's a danger of becoming complacent. You know, you do a repetitive task, that might be hazardous. Uh, there's times where that can lead to an injury or something because you just become so used to it, you don't see the danger anymore, and you become complacent. So at the uh, 
risk of becoming too familiar, it's kind of good to be able to talk about our communion with God and how we practice it. And it's just kind of like a refresher course, I guess you could say. After all, we're just people, right? And we're, we get tired. And when we come, uh, often we're just, uh, we've come from busy week. We also might be coming because we have uh, sickness in our family and uh, friends and that. We might be dealing with grief and, uh, or loneliness and disappointment. And now these are the times where we come and we practice uh, communion. So do we have a model of what this should look like? Well, yes, we do. Uh, first of all, I'm just going to read in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verse 19. These are kind of familiar words. They're uh, during the Last Supper when Jesus is with his uh, disciples. He said, it said, he took bread and he gave thanks and then he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's an invitation to imitate. It's uh, Jesus saying, I'm leading by example. Now do this yourselves in remembrance of me. You won't see me do this again. But when I'm not here anymore, you'll have an opportunity to do this yourselves. I don't think that the disciples fully grasped the significance of this or what the purpose was, but we read later in uh, the, the book of Acts, we read Peter's words. So if you just want to look in Acts chapter 2, and we'll read in verse 36, and just kind of bring this up so that it gives us a little bit of a, an example of what it looked like for the early church. Now we kind of have fast-forwarded, and Peter and the apostles are leading the early church, and, uh, and this is a church that's made up of Jews. And so in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, it says, that there's, it's a long chapter, but I'm just going to focus on verse 36. Peter has kind of spoken to the, Jewish, to the Jews at that time, and then he just says, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, who we're talking about here, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other disciples, or the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And so I just wanted to kind of read that. And did you catch that, uh, how they responded? So Peter, he didn't kind of hold back. He just wanted to be really clear and to state, he said, just be assured of this. This is a fact. The God, God has made this Jesus, this same Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. They would have understood that, the fact that, that Jesus is the Messiah. And when they fully realized it, it cut to the heart. This is a sign of deep conviction from God. And it's interesting because you can see right away in their response, the stubbornness of their heart is removed. Not, it's obvious in the New Testament that not all the Jews uh, were so accepting. Uh, most were completely stubborn and set in their ways, and they, were, they refused. They rejected Jesus. But these Jews here, when they heard Peter speak to them, they were cut to the heart. And uh, is that not sometimes necessary? Like, it hurts, but God cuts us to the heart in order to get to, the, uh, to our heart and to get to the uh, core of the issue. And so when they asked uh, Peter and uh, said, brothers, what shall we do? We go down to verse 42, and we see what they did. These believers now, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And in verse 46, it says, they broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. So all of a sudden now we see, like, so what did it look like? Uh, did it say they began, like, building churches and... Um, and having worship services, and it says that they, they followed the apostles' teaching, so they had to submit to the teachings of the apostles. They fellowship, so they didn't uh, go their own way and keep separate, but they actually came together. They, they wanted to be unified, and they broke bread together, and they prayed together. So these are all kind of like a, a model for us. It's like if we sometimes... Uh, uh, designers, they have to go back to the model, right? They're building a prototype or they're 
they're trying to improve, and it's like, okay, let's just go back to the drawing board. Let's go back to the model. Let's take a look at this again. So something's not working. So uh, it's always good to go to the model, the early church, and see what were they doing? How did they do this, you know? So in the New Testament, uh, in some of the New Testament, we read the early Christians met together for something called the Lord's Supper. So uh, the Lord's Supper, communion, or breaking bread, it's, uh, it's the same thing in practice. Uh, in fact, uh, in the Greek, I think it's the Greek, I, I don't know what the Greek word or the term is, but it, it translates as breaking bread. And so this will be significant later. Uh, I'm going to kind of talk about this a little later. So right in here, right now, I just want to be clear. When we observe our communion service uh, here in our church, um, either on Sunday mornings at the end of our service, or at Easter time, or whenever it might be, uh, as often as we do it, we never want to get to a point where it gets neglected, where it gets uh, unimportant, or it gets shuffled out. It's sometimes difficult to, to keep the importance of the Lord's Supper because it's, it, it can, in our church service, feel sometimes it, become like, it becomes like an add-on or a conclusion to our service, but it really is its own entity. And it just, it's kind of important to make that distinction that when we observe the Lord's Supper, when we uh, commemorate, which is another way of saying uh, we celebrate or we commemorate the death of the Lord, um, then we're actually fulfilling this ordinance. We're doing exactly what Jesus said in the Last Supper. He said, as often as you do this, remember me. Do this and remember me. So I'm going to read something here, and uh, I don't think uh, everybody gets an opportunity to look at this. Um, uh, we used to, I'm not even sure if we still have it, but on the counter we often, uh, we used to have our church statement of faith, and sometimes um, when people visit, it's important when you come to a church for the first time, you just want to know what's this church about. And uh, our statement of faith, we actually uh, have it borrowed it from the Fed Pacific, so we kind of have, take on the same uh, articles of the faith, and uh, there's one entitled of baptism and the Lord's Supper. It kind of falls under the whole statement, and I just read it to you. So that way, if you wonder, like, what does our church believe about this? This is our statement here. We believe that Christian baptism is the immersion in water of a believer into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That it is the direct command of Christ. That it shows the believer's union with the crucified, buried, and the risen Christ, the believer's death to sin, and his, his or her resurrection to new life. It's a condition of church membership, and according to the scriptural order, baptism should come before the observance of the Lord's Supper. With the use of bread and the cup, after solemn self-examination, the believers are to commemorate together the death of Christ. So that's kind of like in a nutshell, that's uh, our statement. And if anyone has any questions about our statement of faith or they want to uh, have something clarified, you can come talk to me or come to one of the elders. So what does it mean to commemorate the Lord's death? As I was saying before, it's another way, commemoration is another way of saying celebrate by doing or celebrate by practicing. I think I like the word practicing better because it's kind of like, we never quite. We never feel like we quite arrived. Like uh, sometimes it feels kind of crude. Our our method of uh, as people of trying to do this. You know, we think, man, the Lord, He would have done it perfectly. But I just feel like I'm fumbling with this. But but the Lord's like, it's okay. Keep going forward. Just practice. Practice. I'll be with you. My Spirit is with you. Whether we call it communion or the Lord's Supper or breaking of bread, it's uh, it's all the same thing. So this is such a big topic, and I just want to kind of narrow the scope. So I just want to talk about the emblem of the bread, um, because there is, in the remembrance service, there's the bread and the wine, the cup of wine, which is what the Lord used in, in that uh, first opportunity. But uh, today, I just want to kind of look at the bread. So uh, if you turn to, in your Bibles here, John chapter 6, I'll give you a chance to just turn to John chapter 6 and... We'll look at verse, uh, start in verse 27 here. So 
So it says here, John chapter 6, uh, verse 27, just to give you a context, Jesus, uh, he has fed uh, the, the 5,000 and he has come across the lake and, and the Jews are following him and they want more of this miraculous sign. Like they, they realize, man, he, he fed us this bread from heaven. And um, so they come and they say, uh, how did you get here? <laughs> and uh, it's interesting because in reading this passage, we'll see that what Jesus actually says, he's not patronizing them, but he, his words kind of offend them. Don't be so concerned about perishable things, uh, just starting in verse 27. So don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. The Jews responded, Show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do, Jesus? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. For the scriptures say, Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus corrects them. Uh, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. And then if we jump down to verse 41, it says the people actually began to murmur in disagreement. Right away you see Jesus kind of offends them. They kind of get their back up. And they're talking amongst themselves. They're like, do we agree with him? Is it possible that he could be the bread from heaven? So they murmur in disagreement. But he says again, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And then if we skip down to verse 47, he says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I say it again. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread which I will offer so the world may live is my flesh. So ask yourself this question. Why would the Jews be so offended? Uh, I realize from our perspective, we're wondering, like, why weren't they more accepting? Why didn't they uh, accept what Jesus said? I don't see the entire issue here. I don't see why they're getting so offended. Why did uh, they get offended when Jesus identified himself as the bread that came down from heaven? Do you remember what it said in uh, Psalm 78? I think uh, if we just kind of, if I flip back to it here, it says Psalm 78, uh, just uh, verse 21, 22, it says, Yet God gave a command to the skies above, and he opened the doors of heavens of the heavens, and he rained down manna for the people to eat. He gave them the grain of heaven. So right away, I believe some of the Jews would have understood that, and they would have thought, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. Jesus, what are you saying here? You're the bread of heaven? And so keep in mind, it wouldn't be unusual for Jews to question this if they understood the law of Moses. And this is where I'm going to, I apologize for jumping around. Just stay with me here. Uh, let's turn to the book of Leviticus, chapter 3. And you can keep your finger in John, chapter 6 there. But we'll just go to Leviticus, chapter 3. Sometimes I feel like uh, when I speak, I often go to Leviticus. I think it, I, I kind of, uh, I find a lot of uh, um, good in it there. So, so Leviticus, chapter 3. And if we turn to or look at verse 14 to 16, there's a key here. It's something uh, called the bread of God here. So it doesn't say it in this passage, but I'll explain here. So Leviticus 3, verses 14 to 16. The priest must present part of this offering as a special gift to the Lord. So this includes all the fat around the internal organs, the two kidneys, it's speaking about the uh, sacrifice that's being offered uh, to God. These are, uh, so it's the animal that's been slaughtered. And now these parts are being described here. So the two kidneys and the fat around the kidneys, near the loins, and the long lobe of the liver, these must be removed with the kidneys, and the priest will burn them on the altar. And this is a special gift of food. 
a pleasing aroma to the Lord. All the fat belongs to the Lord. So I just wanted to read that. And um, as we see here, this, the, well, the description might kind of make some of us uh, squeamish a little bit, but uh, it's important to understand there's a reason why this is explained here. Uh, and I kind of think it was interesting to me because I, I often read in different versions. I might read in the New Living from time to time or uh, go to the New International Version or different other versions. But uh, there's something lost in some of the, uh, the newer English translations. And there's, if we go back to the, uh, the older English translations, they kind of lend a little bit of clarification to it. And there's a term for this, uh, what, what we're reading here, and it's called the bread of God. So uh, I kind of looked it up here in a Bible commentary, and there's one, uh, Charles Ellicott, he uh, had a, a several volumes of a commentary on the Bible. Um, he died in 1905, so he, over 100 years ago. And he wrote about this passage in Leviticus 3. So he gave, gives a little bit of clarification here. And he says, The food or bread, that is, which the fire upon the altar was to consume for God or the sacrifice, is that which was burnt unto God. And this is called his bread. And the priests who burnt it are described as offering the bread of their God. So that's, uh, that kind of helps us understand what the Jews were saying, what they were understanding here. When Jesus is talking about the bread of heaven, they understood this part of the animal, the sacrifice, was the bread of God. It was something that was for God alone. As we read in Leviticus 3.16, it says, all the fat, and of course this fat that they're talking about is these organs, this part of the animal that God has um, defined. Uh, we think of sometimes the fat of the animal might be the fat on the meat, uh, but it's actually talking about these special parts. It's like, this belongs to the Lord. It's not for man. So I just want to make this point, and in Leviticus uh, 3.17, right below, as we saw, it says, you must never eat any fat or blood. This is a permanent law for you. And it must be observed from generation to generation, wherever you live. And then if I, just, uh, you don't have to look it up, but in Leviticus 7.25, it kind of emphasizes it again. It says, anyone who eats fat from an animal presented as a special gift to the Lord will be cut off from the community. So this is the warning to the people. God gave this to Moses, and Moses passed it on. In the old King James, it said, For whoever eats the fat of the beast, even their soul that eats it will be cut off from his people. So it actually kind of gives it a little bit more power because it's like you realize there was a deep fear that if anyone took this for themselves, God would, uh, according to his law, he'd say, well, you are cut off. Your soul is cut off. So you can begin to appreciate when Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life. I am the bread that comes down from heaven. They're kind of, uh, they're offended. And in John chapter 6, if we want to flip back there, verse 51, he says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. But Jesus' words are true. We, we mustn't forget that. Who was right and who was wrong? Well, Jesus was speaking the truth. The Jews didn't quite understand what he was, uh, what he what he meant. They couldn't understand it at that point. So, I just wanted to clarify when we talk about the bread. That kind of helps us understand a little bit about um, what this means when we actually take communion. We see, okay, in the Old Testament, the bread of God was God's provision. He provided it uh, in the form of an animal, and then that animal was offered to God as a sacrifice for the atonement of sins. And we know, like in the story of uh, Abraham and Isaac, God provided a substitute. He provided an animal that became a substitute for Isaac, and that animal died in Isaac's place as an atonement. So I just wanted to kind of clarify that, and uh, I just wanted to make a point here when we went through the, um, 
statement of faith, we talked about, it kind of talked about baptism and the Lord's Supper. I just kind of wanted to remind you, so we were talking about how a person becomes a Christian, and then when they've made that decision and they've become a Christian, the way is open, they can now be baptized, they can take the next step. And when they become baptized, it's just a one-time thing. You're baptized once, and then from that point on, you have the Lord's Supper, you have communion that can be repeated and practiced again and again. We don't expect people to be baptized more than once. Baptize, being baptized once is enough. When you make that public declaration, uh, you're uh, honoring God with your life, and you're making a commitment. And then from that point on, it, it's like, uh, what do we do from that point on? Well, the Lord gave us this lasting ordinance. He's like, practice this as often as you can, just like the early church. So it says, the statement of faith says, it shows forth the believer's union with the crucified, buried, and risen Christ. And baptism should come before the observance of the Lord's Supper. So we understand from the Bible, if someone repents and they accept the free gift of forgiveness of their sins by Jesus' death on the cross, they be, uh, and becomes a, <coughs> excuse me, a Christian, there is nothing standing in their way of being baptized. The Lord's Supper takes us from that point through to the end of our life on earth. It's not meant to be a mundane ritual. It's a practice, and it can be practiced in different ways. And I, I think if you uh, go to different churches, you might even see different formats of the way they, they do it. Um, different churches have, do follow different formats, but every one of them is commemorating the Lord's death. It's our offering, much like the burnt offering that was offered. Uh, we don't offer, uh, Jesus is our atonement. He's the offering that atones for our sin. But then in, in the days to come, we offer uh, our worship to God as a sacrifice that's pleasing to God. And that's a part of like uh, practicing communion. So in whatever format we follow, we, it's important that we give enough time. Like it, it can't really be like something that's done in just a few minutes. It really, uh, it should give, you should give it enough time. Sometimes you can use music, you can read the word of God, people can share uh, their insight and stuff like that, but uh, it shouldn't be rushed. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm sure in the early church, when you think of, when it said that they broke bread, I know we kind of think of it sometimes that I read actually that often they would do it in the evenings on, on the first day of the week, on the Lord's Day. They would come together and they were going to have a meal together because they shared everything. But they would also break bread, which is significant because you know that that doesn't just mean they just got together and had a meal. They actually took the bread and they followed the command. They followed the example that Jesus gave. And they, they didn't want to forget the Lord's death. So it was kind of a visual reminder. Uh, the only work that Jesus really requires of us in working out our salvation is what we read in John chapter 6, verse 29. He said this to the Jews because they were saying, uh, tell us, like, uh, what works can we do? Uh, what does God want us to do? And he's like, the only thing that God wants you to do, to do is to believe in the one he has sent. So a part of believing is that we have to re refresh and renew our, our love for, the, for God in, in practice. So, you know, it, it's like I was saying, it's easy to become familiar with something, and even our communion service, it can become kind of just familiar, and it's kinda, it, it comes, becomes ritualistic. It's just like uh, something we do, and move on, let's get on with life. But actually, it has a huge significance as we saw when we read about the bread of God, we see that the Jews, they would have understood, and that the believing Jews in the early church, they would have, as they broke bread, they would have thought of what Jesus did. And why is it significant, the picture of Jesus breaking the bread? I, I don't know what kind of bread Jesus would have had. It says that he took the bread that was there and he broke it in front of them. And I think, well, they were celebrating Passover, so in the Passover celebration, they would have unleavened bread, so I don't know if it was unleavened bread or if it, uh, I always used, as a kid, we would kind of have communion and there would, 
be a practice where we'd have a big loaf like this one on the table here. And uh, instead of like the way we do it with the, like uh, nowadays, it's just not appropriate to pass a loaf of bread around and have everybody rip a piece off anymore. That's the way we did it when we were growing up. So, and it was okay back then. But uh, it was kind of a visual thing because during that service, at some point, someone would step forward and the first thing they would do is they would take that loaf of bread and they would give thanks, just like Jesus did. They would hold it up. Jesus lifted the bread up and he gave thanks for it. He said, thank you, Father, for this bread. And it was a representation, a symbol of his body. And I know that the disciples that, that day, that night or whatever, when they were celebrating, they were watching this, but did it make sense? I'm sure it didn't. It was like the very first time, and, it, and Jesus hadn't yet died yet. They were still, you think of everything that was going to happen a few hours after that, and yet they were watching him, and he took this loaf in front of them, he gave thanks for it, and then he broke it, and then he gave it to them. He's like, this loaf is my body. I give it to you. Take it and eat it. And, and as we understand, if Jesus is saying this, we, there's a, it seems like there's a bit of conflict from the Old Testament because God reserves this bread of God for himself. He says, no person should eat uh, this, this fat of the animal. It's offered to me. It's not to you. So it, it, kind of, it, it would have been difficult, but Jesus' words are true. And he, he was making a new covenant, and he was saying, it's okay now. I'm the Son of God. I'm God, and I'm offering my body as the bread of God for you. You can take it. God has given it to me. He's given me his approval, and now you can take this bread and take it for yourself. And this is going to, my life, this bread is a representation of me and my body and my life, which is given for you. It's through my death that you're going to be saved. So it says in Matthew 26, 26, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it, and then he broke it in pieces and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. So it's a powerful image. I just, uh, I, I guess I, I kind of go back in my mind, and I think sometimes when we celebrate uh, communion uh, with what we have, and I think it's totally appropriate. But I also, um, as we take the emblems, uh, we take the bread, which, you know, it might be uh, little pieces of cracker or, it could be like a little wafers or whatever it is. It's a symbol. But the significance of taking this loaf, just like it is here, having somebody take it in their hands and offer it, giving it to God, much like the priest would have in the Old Testament, and then breaking it. It's such a visual, you know? You think of the body of Jesus... Jesus did that. <laughs> and when you think of when his body was broken, well, the world might say it was a tragedy. I think Jordan kind of alluded to that in one of his messages. It's like, oh, it's just a piece of history. It, I mean, Jesus got caught in the wrong place at the wrong time, and men got a hold of him, and they killed him. That's the end of the story. But actually, what we understand when Jesus is doing that, the significance, God took his body and broke it and in doing so he brought about our salvation it was in the breaking of Jesus body and as a sacrifice um, he made atonement for us so that's the image I just wanted to present to you guys there because I think sometimes uh, I just wanted to get back to basics and you know like sometimes when we celebrate communion uh, I, I kind of I think about that image in my mind when, when we're celebrating communion, but I, I'm not sure what everyone's familiar with. You know, uh, I don't know everybody's background and where you guys come from, but there's something about, when I think of the early church, I think they, maybe they, they had loaves of bread, and at some point they took it, and as they quietly watched each other. They broke the loaf, and they knew what that meant, and it, and it reminded them, it's like, why was that, bro that loaf broken? Well, Jesus broke the first loaf, and when he did, why did he do it? He's like, this is my body. It's broken for you. So it's a visual image. I just wanted to read a little. Uh, this is kind of where I wanted to finish off. And uh, it's a book I've been, I kind of read and reread. 
again, I always go back to old books, but uh, this, uh, Charles Waller in a book called Silver Sockets. There was a chapter called The Bread of God, and um, I really like how he explained it there. Now, he wrote this in the 1800s, but he says, the bread of God should be, in the first place, given to God for man as a sacrifice before it can be given to man to eat. That's the offering. Eh? When Jesus offered this, lo this bread, as uh, he gave thanks for it. And we think of the priest. The priest took that, those, the fat of the animal, and before he put it on the altar as a burnt offering to be burned, he offered it to God and he said, we know that you provided this to atone for our sins and we thank you for that. And then they put it on the altar and they burnt it. It says here, it is not Christ himself only that is the bread of God, but Christ as given to God for the life of the world. Christ offered and sacrificed. Christ crucified. Not Christ as the miracle worker or the giver of any literal food. So it, it's a symbol, a representation of, of Jesus. It's so hard that the mystery of how Jesus atoned for our sins, we kind of think, I, I sometimes struggle to understand the, the meaning and the significance of it. But, and Jesus knows that. He knows that we as people are visual. You know, we, we really respond to visual things. And uh, for him to take that loaf and to, or that, that bread and to break it, it's something visual, and he's like, you've seen me do it. Now go and do it yourselves and practice. So I encourage you with that. And I just want to give you uh, some ideas because I realize uh, in our church, you know, um, the way we celebrate communion, uh, it would be a great opportunity to do it in a small group too. You know, we always uh, try to encourage people uh, with small groups, and we don't always get the opportunity to... Uh, it's hard when we're meeting together and uh, sometimes even in our service uh, uh, to do it justice, but sometimes uh, in a small group where you have time and, and in a small group of people, it's a great opportunity to, to break bread together and to celebrate communion. And there is the, uh, the emblem of the wine, the cup. I didn't want to talk about that today because that could be something for another day, but uh, it, it's such a big topic. I really just wanted to kind of focus on on the, the bread. So let's just pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for uh, the Word of God. And uh, we just struggle to understand sometimes uh, the meaning of all these things, but then we realize you do explain it. And uh, we thank you, Lord, for the uh, imagery in the Old Testament that helps us to understand uh, what is said in the New Testament. And we understand that uh, the body of the Lord Jesus was broken for us. And help us never to forget it, but to keep on practicing. And Lord, I just want to pray for uh, Jordan too, that you would be with him and Jen, keep him safe, and uh, return him to us. And we just thank you for this day. And we pray this in your name. Amen.